let's talk a little bit about the term environmental racism. Coined in 1982 by U.S. civil rights leader Benjamin Chavis, environmental racism describes the long-standing discriminatory practice of racial discrimination in environmental policy and decision making. In this map by the Enrich Project, the W's represent waste disposal facilities, the T's represent thermal generating stations, which is a coal burning plant with high carbon and sulfur content, meaning it's a major contributor to greenhouse ga gas emissions, and those emissions also pose health impacts ranging from asthma and breathing difficulties to neurological issues, heart problems, and even cancer. The green dots represent First Nations communities, while blue dots represent African Nova Scotian communities. And this map is a visual example of the disproportionate proximity and exposure to contamination and pollution caused by industry. It's important to know that the locations are all made by conscious decisions, not by chance. Environmental racism is a form of systemic racism, and it is the result of institutional policies and practices made by decision makers, which are all embedded in the laws, policies, and institutions that govern our everyday lives. And it has been this way ever since the European settlers first colonized lands across Canada, North America, and other settler colonial countries. In the next two videos in the short series, we'll be going deeper into the impacts with historical examples and their modern impacts across Canada. We'll speak to the vital opportunities in Canada today that will help address environmental racism and also share ways that you can help advance environmental justice in Canada. Y'all, this is how they doing it out here in Flint, Michigan. It ain't no clean water. You cannot drink the water. I had to go to the store just to get some water. I almost died of thirst. Y'all, save us. This is not and healthy. It's supposed to be smart water. It look dumb to me. Real dumb. You may have heard of the Flint, Michigan water crisis, but do you know the terrible details of what actually took place? Welcome to episode 14 of Hidden History, where we discuss the creepy, crazy, and recovered up parts of American history. So back in 2013, the city government of Flint decided to switch the city's water provider to save money. Originally, the water supply came from Lake Huron, but as the transition was happening, they had to temporarily start using water from the Flint River. At the time, Michael Prisby of the MDEQ Office of Drinking Water verified that the quality of the water being put out meets all of our drinking water standards, and Flint water is safe to drink. In mid-2014, residents soon complained about the color of the water, and bacteria was found in the drinking supply, the city responded by increasing chlorine levels in the water. However, the Flint water treatment plant had not implemented the required optimized corrosion control treatment, which led to a series of issues as the water corroded the pipes. UM's Flint campus began testing its water and detected lead in drinking fountains. On October 1, 2015, a public health emergency was declared when the DHHS confirmed results of a study that found high blood lead levels in Flint children. The city then finally urged residents to not drink the water. Follow for part two where we'll discuss the shocking findings that follow this emergency declaration. Stop scrolling. Climate justice needs to be racial justice and we need to talk about it. Modern day slavery in the Congo is powering the rechargeable battery economy. What does this mean? Smartphones, computers, electric vehicles and so much more is powered by coal boat workers in the Congo who are working in slave-like conditions. Most of these workers are called artisanal workers, who are freelance African workers who do extremely dangerous jobs for only a few dollars a day. People are working in subhuman and degrading conditions, using shovels and pickaxes just to scrounge the urge for cobalt. Because of this, millions of trees are being cut down. The air around the mines are hazy with dust and grit, and the water supplies have been contaminated. And also, cobalt is toxic to breathe and touch. Yet these people work with no protection. We cannot transition to a greener world whilst devaluing racialized people and the global south. My vision of a new era is one where protecting the one planet we live on is the norm and not an afterthought. This vision includes revolutionary love for our earth and our communities. One song that inspires me is The Seed by Aurora. When the last tree has fallen and the rivers are poisoned, you cannot eat money. And another song that inspires me is It's a Good Day to Fight the Systems by Shen Gudzo. My soul is incredibly ready to change history. There is hope. The power is with the people and we can apply pressure and rise up. We can get creative about solutions in so many ways, like harnessing the power of music to unite people, to empower people to join the global climate movement.
ever heard of the term pleasure activism? As people advocating for the protection and preservation of people and planet, we have an obligation to ourselves and to the world to protect our joy as we protect our collective home. Pleasure activism has two main elements. First is reshaping traditional activism and organizing work to be as pleasurable as it can be. The second function is making justice and liberation the most pleasurable experiences that we can have. This requires an understanding that pleasure often gets lost under the weight of oppression. So reclaiming that pleasure is liberatory work. Adrienne Marie Brown is an author and activist who popularized the term pleasure activism through the New York Times bestseller book, Pleasure Activism, The Politics of Feeling Good. To learn more about pleasure activism and joy in movement building, listen to episode one of The Joy Report, now available on all streaming platforms. Hey, Child, Greta Thunberg, who recently called out China for its carbon emissions. Greta Thunberg decided to take to Twitter to call out China for its carbon emissions, despite it being her own. I will never forgive y'all for censuring this white girl at the front of the environmentalist and climate change crisis movements. Stuff that she says is shit that indigenous people and black people have been saying for fucking ever. If your environmentalism does not center indigenous people, land back, or indigenous sovereignty, you're not a fucking environmentalist. If your environmentalism doesn't include environmental racism or environmental justice, then you're not an environmentalist. Y'all will do everything except decenter yourself from movements. Y'all's people are the reason why we are in this mess in the fucking first place. Marginalized groups of people are affected the most by climate change, but they are blamed the most for it. I don't care that she sailed across the ocean in a fucking boat. I care about the fact that indigenous people are having their water rights taken away. Start getting your education and information from BIPOC environmentalists and stop centering white people at the front of this fucking movement. Environmentalists love to talk about the land not needing people. However, for many indigenous cultures, the thought of land not needing people, it's alien and sometimes offensive. Because we know firsthand how to live in harmony with the natural world. In fact, we did so since time immemorial. The problem isn't the people themselves. We believe it's a part of our sacred responsibility to ensure the continuum of life on all of Mother Earth. That means to step away for us is like not upholding our sacred responsibility, kind of like walking away from our own mothers. The romanticization of human absence has been a great wall between environmentalists and indigenous worldviews, so let's tear that wall down. And chimigwech for watching. Hi. It's come to my attention that a lot of people still feel a lot of climate anxiety um, due to things happening like the Willow Project and all the nonsense in the world. So here's a few things I tell myself that helps me deal with climate anxiety as a, an environmental activist. First off, we're not alone. Through my studies and my efforts, I've had a chance to see what people have been doing in places like the Amazon jungle, Iceland, throughout the West Coast, and a few other places in Europe. And there's a lot of people out there who are concerned and who are taking action and are making a difference in the world. Second fact, a lot of the changes that we need to see in the world, um, even though we feel like they might take centuries to happen, they don't. <clears throat> if you look at history, a lot of civil and social changes that have happened occur within a period of about 10 to 15 years or so. Now, I'm not saying in 10 to 15 years we're going to solve climate change as an issue, but in 10 to 15 years we'll be able to handle some of the smaller issues that lead up to a healthier planet. So if you feel like things are not going to change, look back at what the world was like even just 15 years ago. Third, we're not going to solve climate change alone. And we have a lot of help, not just talking about other people. But when we get to working on healing our planet, we're going to be doing it alongside the animals and the plants that share the planet with us. And they've been trying to take care of it for millions of years now. So it's just about time that we kind of help out. And fourth, if you pick some kind of <clears throat> ideology or philosophy that allows you to connect to Mother Earth, well, then you'll be fine. Because in every argument about the dangers of climate change, he speaks about how it's going to hurt humans, not Mother Earth. The planet will go on. But if as humans we become one with the planet, because we are one with the planet we're born in, then we'll be fine. As long as we live, 
according to the rules and the care of the planet. Now, climate change is still a very real issue, but these things that I tell myself help me lift the weights of it off my shoulders a bit, because being an activist in this troubled time can be scary and just outright just demoralizing. <clears throat> but even in the last three years since I started a nonprofit around climate change, it's been going great, so I'm just excited to see where it goes from now. And follow. Do you want to know what indigenous environmental planning is? You came to the right place. Today, I want to talk about indigenous environmental planning in Canada and why it's so important. As we all know, the environment is a crucial part of our lives, and it's essential that we take care of it. However, traditional environmental planning often overlooks the unique perspectives and needs of Indigenous communities. This is where Indigenous environmental planning comes in. Indigenous environmental planning is a process that takes into account the cultural, social, and spiritual values of Indigenous communities when creating plans for land use and resource management. This approach recognizes that Indigenous peoples have a deep connection to the land and that their knowledge and expertise are essential for a sustainable environmental management. Despite its importance, Indigenous environmental planning faces many challenges. For example, many Indigenous communities lack the resources and capacity to fully participate in the planning process. Additionally, there is often a lack of recognition and respect for Indigenous knowledge and perspectives within mainstream environmental planning. However, successful implement implementation of Indigenous environmental planning can lead to many benefits. These can include increased community involvement and empowerment, improved environmental outcomes, and strengthened relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. In conclusion, Indigenous environmental planning is an essential tool for ensuring sustainable environmental management in Canada. I encourage you all to learn more about this topic and support Indigenous communities in their efforts to protect the environment. 16 young people are suing the state of Montana over climate inaction. They're taking Montana to court for supporting the fossil fuel industry, which is destroying the environment and violating their right to clean air and water. The state tried to toss out the climate case many times since it was filed in 2020, but these young people didn't give up. As extreme weather events continue to threaten states like Montana, the stakes have only gotten higher. This case shows that young people can and will step up to take control of their own futures. In rural Alabama, hookworm, a parasitic disease long thought eradicated in the United States re-emerged in areas where basic sanitation remains unaffordable for homeowners. Yet instead of helping its own constituents, the Alabama Department of Public Health aggressively penalized black homeowners in Lowndes County for the crime of being unable to afford a functional septic system. Now, after a years-long legal battle, the people of Lowndes County are getting justice. The U.S. Department of Justice and the Department of Health and Human Services are requiring the state of Alabama to suspend its punitive sanitation enforcement, which has previously resulted in arrest warrants for black residents. The state must also conduct an assessment of wastewater management systems in Lowndes County and engage in a public health awareness campaign. The Alabama Department of Public Health must comply with all the terms of the interim settlement over the next year. This marks the first ever settlement of an environmental justice case under federal civil rights laws by the Department of Justice. In Miami, I know people don't know and understand the racism that happened in Miami, but Miami, unlike other cities, they put black people to the center of the city on a ridge. There we go. So they put us on a ridge inside of the center of the city because when they came into the city, they wanted to build out the beach. Miami's supposed to be this beautiful tropical playground for nor northerners to come down and have fun in during the winter time for all the snowbirds to come on down to Miami. It's beach weather right now. Um, so they built this place for that. However, people had to live, so people started to move into other areas, so they forced black people into the center of the city. Now, 100 plus years ago, that probably was a great idea, but now Miami is ground zero for sea level rise in the world. Not just the country, the world.
Okay, we are expecting up to six feet of water into our city. So right now, you have places like Miami Beach, South Beach, sitting at zero or under sea level, right? So you have communities like Liberty City and Little Haiti, Overtown, Alapata, Little Havana, Coconut Grove, and some of us are sitting eight feet, 10 feet, 17 feet, 15 feet above sea level. Now I know for people who are from like- Here's the easiest way that I can explain environmental racism. Go to a predominantly black neighborhood. Tell me how many Whole Foods you see. Trader Joe's. Now tell me how many Walmarts and McDonald's and Burger Kings you see. Now, since you're already in the neighborhood, go check out the school. What's it look like? How big is the library? Do some digging. How much do they spend per student per year? Now go to the white neighborhood. That Whole Foods nice, ain't it? Ooh, that school big. They football team got all the equipment. Did y'all know there's a scientific name for the current hell we are living through? And by hell, I mean living under late stage capitalism during a climate crisis. We are living in a time period called the Anthropocene. These come from the words anthro, which means man, and scene, which means the age of. So the Anthropocene literally means that we are living in the age of man. This basically means that scientists are able to look at the Earth's rock layers and determine that humans are altering the face of the Earth faster than the Earth's own geologic processes. For the first time in Earth's 4.5 billion year history. This graph shows all of Earth's history, from the Earth's formation, to when dinosaurs roamed the planet, up until the Holocene, where we see evidence of the first modern humans. Now for the Earth, the Holocene was pretty stable. Humans started having communities and being able to grow agriculture, which means that population boomed. But that relatively stable time period is over because now we are living in the Anthropocene. Now this graph says it started in 1950, but that's still being debated by scientists because there's a lot of potential start dates for when humans really started messing things up. Some say 1950 because of the spike in nuclear radiation seen in the Earth because of nuclear bomb testing from World War II. But there are also arguments for the beginning of the Industrial Revolution being the start from 1492 through early modernity when European colonizers were colonizing. Or even the domestication of fire. Regardless of when it started though, we in that hoe. And if scientists are heavily acknowledging it, maybe our government should acknowledge it too. I was told by a lot of people, including my family members, Kheti is not for everybody. My name is Diljinder Singh. Before working with the Khethi, I used to work in Jet Airways. Revolutionary changes have come to the Khethi. People have adopted, seen, and learned everything. Despite all that, we consider ourselves as failures. We have last to last year, when we have done it, it's been one year, the factories have not done it. Industry is not affected as much. Who is doing it? The people have to take a loan. The children have to pay their fees. They have to cut down their daily costs. My daughter is now 9 years old. She helps me a lot. When you take things to nature, you feel good. It's a good interaction. When you look at the economic aspect, which runs your life, I would never ask her to get rid of it. Only because of the policies. Only because of the policies. My home, my Pakistan, is being destroyed by the climate crisis. I fight for climate justice and women's rights so that women in Pakistan do not have to be threatened by the crisis of the patriarchy. I attend and organize protests, I speak at different events, and I use social media and community organizing to hold campaigns and advocate. And I do it because of all the strong women that I have around me who uplift, inspire, and share unfiltered love and joy with each other. The women I know in the climate justice space in Pakistan are remarkable. We have held each other as we have cried, as we have been threatened by people in power, as we spend days and nights working. We have shared duas and told each other to stay safe at protests where tear gas was thrown and hugged and laughed together when we achieved something. It is young women today that we see leading the climate movement globally as well as in Pakistan. This is because young women bring passion, resilience, their pain and empathy to the table. They are, we are, on the front lines. We defend our land, our earth, and we defend each other. 
and that is why and who I fight for. I think billionaires shouldn't exist. I have many challenges to philanthropic capitalism. I think that the climate crisis was caused by capitalism um, and inequality and oppression are not an accident. So to create a liberated world, we have to really challenge these systems and go to the root. Intersectionality demands us to see that all the struggles that exist in the world don't happen in silos. Everything is inherently connected. And therefore we have to interrogate power as well. We can't just talk about redistributing like wealth if we're not just redistributing power as well as that. So when we interrogate power, we have to then ask like, who, who holds the power in this room? Who holds the power in the world? Who's deciding what solutions are being chosen? Like whose name is on the foundation? Who's making those decisions? And then therefore who's creating the narratives and who's in control of those narratives? And how does that maybe limit the solutions that we're pursuing? Maybe we're not actually transforming the world. Maybe we're just continuing the world as it is now. And I think that that means like intersectionality demands us to look to indigenous resistance groups that are really challenging the world as it is now, are really uprooting these oppressive systems and are transforming to make a better world. But those are often the groups that don't receive huge amounts of funding or no strings attached funding because they challenge corporate interests. And I think that if we want to transform the world, we have to actually challenge corporate interests because we shouldn't have a world where some people have loads and loads of other people, the majority of people have nothing at all. And so I think intersectionality demands us to um, really challenge the world as it is now and instead ask for something better and something more. Um, and we have to demand more because we really can transform the world if we do that. I remember in 2009 we did a study on the third pole, on the Himalayan ecosystems, the impact on climate change. And all the pressure was put by the polluters to say, deny that the glaciers are melting. Deny. Our government flipped overnight to say they're not melting. Actually, they're increasing. So these new reports are extremely important. And the Himalaya, Himalayan snows don't just support the people in the Himalaya, they support half of humanity. Because all the rivers to the most densely populated part of the world emerge from the Himalaya. And the consequences of this are huge. But the most important thing is, those women in Ladakh with whom I work, the Women's Alliance, they don't use one drop of oil or one ounce of gas. They are totally in a renewable energy economy and they are being punished. That's why climate justice is such an important part of avoiding climate catastrophe. That's a really solid question. Uh, the answer is uh, very deep. The answer is no. Holding my phone, checking for reception, calling numerous times. No one answered. Just recently, we had a twin cyclone never before we have seen in the history of Vanuatu. One after the other, category four to five. While the community is picking up their pits and pieces on tropical cyclone Chudi, Kevin hit. I'm in Port Vila. My sisters are in this island. The communication that I can access was only through phones. However, at that time when the twin cyclone hit, everything shut down. I had no clue how to reach the women in Eromango. Has Eromango been wiped out? Have they survived? Oh, they did not survive. The moment is so tense for me to wait for that phone call to hear if there are still someone on the other side of the line. It takes three days for us to have connection again so I can talk to the women and get to find out they have survived because of the early warning preparedness we've made. There's no casualty and I am one of the proudest, happiest women living a life to talk about this story. Women are the first responders and are the frontliners in times of crisis. We will nurse, we will teach, we will look after, we care, and we will lead. When there's a cyclone coming, I'll let them know, tighten your, your roof, your touch roof. Store food, prepare your garden for the impact of severe weather. Had rations ready, identify evacuation center that is safe for you. And this is not 
theory writing, this is the realities and the narrative of the stories of women having that leadership in humanitarian action. Assisting the leaders in saving the lives of their own homes, their own communities and the entire island. And we could see that when you trust women, when you put resource to the hand of women, when you invest in women, the women will become resilient, their house will be resilient, the community will be resilient, they will be resilient. Black people in the woods, sing it with me y'all. Black people in the woods, yeah. Black people in the woods, one more time. Black people in the woods, big finale y'all, big finale. Black people in the woods. If Hawaiians tell us not to come to their home, why do some of you still keep going? Yes, it's beautiful, love trips. There are a million other places for us to go. Let what's happening right now in Hawaii be another reminder as to why they say we're taking their resources. There are thousands of tourists being flown and relocated to different islands. Meanwhile, native Hawaiians are dying all because you wanna travel there and go to a beach and flick up. Please be serious. And I Wait a second, wait. You have to realize that the reason that conservatives and neoliberals by and large either don't believe in climate change or ignore it to take measures that will actively worsen its impacts is not because they are individually stupid. It's because they recognize that the existence of human-caused catastrophic climate change is the ultimate refutation of all of their beliefs. I'm currently working my way through This Changes Everything, and in it, Naomi Klein outlines how our economic model, our political system, and fundamentally the way that we have structured our society is at war and in conflict with our environment. Oftentimes when you hear conservatives talking about climate change, they'll say something along the lines of, the left is just using climate change to sneak in Marxist principles into our society then fundamentally, they're not wrong. The climate crisis can only be addressed by an embrace of anti-capitalist values. Klein writes that what the climate needs to avoid collapse is a contraction in humanity's use of resources. What our economic model demands to avoid collapse is unfettered expansion. Only one of these sets of rules can be changed. It's why you now have scientists all across the globe finally embracing economic degrowth a set of policy positions entirely centered around combating infinite growth of capital in order to save our environment. Conservatives are so afraid of climate change because it means their entire ideology of consumerism, individualism, and Western ideals and cosmology is entirely wrong. Capitalism is verifiably unable to combat climate change and we've seen it over and over again. And that means if we really want this problem to be solved, there's only one alternative. Reality is leftist, which means that conservatives need to deny reality in order for their beliefs to stay intact. That is why they deny and ignore and underestimate climate change. Somebody asked me today, how could Maui be on fire? How could Hawaii be on fire if it's an island surrounded by water? Well, before the United States colonized Hawaii, Maui was home to very rich wetlands. However, mass water diversion toward sugar plantation destroyed and ate at these wetlands. And water and water resources are continually depleted today by tourism. The devastation that we're seeing in Hawaii right now really brings home the point that the environmental crisis is a colonial issue and that movements toward environmental justice must also be decolonial to get at the root of the issue and must include indigenous people. Link in my bio has a spreadsheet where you can donate to the families that are being directly impacted by this disaster. Please share if you can't donate and please donate, especially if you have vacationed at Hawaii before. Money, money, money makes the world my neck all big shots on my ankles. I drink out my bra, I go military boys with the angles. Got to upgrade the stars out of space for me. Lot of blue cash in a rubber band. Mounted, she in Barbie land. Drop a count of diamonds like I'm by the team. I'm a string egg, Kurt Cobain. First to death, Gucci on my tomb.
Hawaiians tell us not to come to their home. Why do some of you still? The same reason why people can't stop moving to Puerto Rico after Puerto Ricans have told y'all to stop moving there because you're making it more expensive for them to live there. These same islands that have been annexed by European and US powers are constantly overlooked and overshadowed until someone needs a vacation or a piña colada. These islands are constantly glamorized by the European gays that want power over them until it's time to help them restore theirs. And if the European and Western colonizers couldn't keep their hands off these islands due to their exotic resources, of course their descendants can't do the same. And what's going on in Hawaii, specifically Maui, is devastating, but the way some people are handling it doesn't surprise me. Similar to how Puerto Rico was suffering due to the hurricanes of 2017 and a lot of their struggles were overlooked by the media. And what's even more effed up are the people that still go to these islands in their times of need and then get upset when they're not the perfect selfie spot they imagined. And I'm not saying don't go to these islands because they are beautiful, but give them time to heal. Oops a daisy, scientists figured out how to turn humid air into free renewable Fuck 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 shit 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 mm, fuck I, damn, I can't even fucking believe my shit A bit desensitized to the news of the fire's devastation We live in Reading so we had the car fire a few years ago We, we literally could see the flames from our driveway The sheer lack of humanity Here we have an entire town, an entire island decimated nearly wiped off the fucking earth schools hospitals businesses entire neighborhoods gone over a hundred people are dead and thousands more have been displaced these people were not giving adequate warning they have not been provided with adequate supplies or resources they've been put in the position to sacrifice themselves and their children for a chance at survival yet the most pressing concern for some of christopher columbus's descendants is their fucking vacation being ruined. Vacations that native Hawaiians have been telling y'all to stop taking because they have a fragile ecosystem and a bunch of funky ass leather skinned tourists using up the resources they do have has made life unbearable for the locals. But we share a society with people who will literally step over dead bodies in the quest for self gratification. How can you find paradise in other people's pain? Now I'm going to hit you guys with the reality. Uh, so I, I'm getting a lot of messages. A lot of people are telling me like, you're doing so much, you're doing so much. You see everything that I'm doing, it is not enough. We need to open the fucking roads. And if anybody is going into Lahaina, if anyone can get through Lahaina, bring your fucking car full of supplies. Everything you could possibly bring. Don't go to Lahaina if you're empty handed. There's so many people out here that need help. We can with five trucks loaded, decked out, and that is not enough. That's like enough for one neighborhood. There are thousands of people out here. We need medicine. We need pillows, blankets, food, drinks, as much water as we can. There's so many people. Hi, if you're indigenous or care about indigenous advocacy, please watch this video for like 30 seconds. Hi, I'm Loli Joy. I am the founder of People Not Mascots, which works on policy to remove native mascots from United States public schools. People Not Mascots has done a lot of amazing things that I'm super proud of, but we're also looking to continue our work and expand what we do. If you're interested in our work, you can go check out our website. And if you're interested in becoming an advocate yourself or working with us, there's a volunteer form now in my bio. We are specifically looking for people who are passionate about native mascot removal and passionate about ending the missing murder indigenous people crisis. Also, if you're a native environmentalist, we're looking for you as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Nobody gives a fuck. Go to therapy and shut the fuck up and have an ice caramel macchiato in that order. These guys just won a climate change trial against US state. They're all young climate activists. They said Montana was responsible for climate change affecting them. Basically, a state law back in 2011 made it illegal for new projects to consider the impact on climate when doing an environmental review. And that's what the young activists targeted with their lawsuit. They argued they were guaranteed a clean and healthy environment by the state's constitution. And, during the trial, they showed the court evidence that carbon dioxide emissions were linked to hotter temperatures and wildfires. 
Then they said that could harm their mental and physical health. And the district judge agreed with them. They said the state's approval of fossil fuel permits was unconstitutional because they don't evaluate greenhouse gas emissions. But the state attorney general does plan to appeal. They said the ruling was absurd and said Montanans couldn't be blamed for changing the climate. I'll be dead by the time it matters. Why should I care about being sustainable? I have heard that so many times and it never fails to just completely break my brain because First of all, not to get political, but climate change is real, uh, it's happening, and you can literally see it by just stepping outside. Canada has literally been on fire for like the entire summer, and we could literally see and inhale that smoke all the way down here in our home in Virginia. But in a way, that's kind of besides the point I'm trying to make here. You should not have to be positively or negatively impacted by something in order to care about it. This beautiful planet we call home literally gives us everything we need to survive, so it's our responsibility to take care of it like we would our favorite pet or one of our kids. And speaking of kids, I'm sure that not a single person watching this video would want their child to inherit millions of dollars worth of debt, so why would you leave them the burden of fixing this broken planet that we continue to harm more and more every single day? Because I promise you, as daunting as it sounds, making like $4 million is a lot easier than reversing irreversible climate change. This is a bit shit. Literally, raw sewage was pumped for around 300,000 hours in areas like this last year. Traces of pharmaceuticals, recreational drugs, and pesticides have been found in the water such as high concentrations of ketamine, which has been found in wildlife like oysters and crabs. What makes this even worse is that this is supposed to be a conservation area. Doesn't look like it. I'm young and I'm positive. I do things that I've never not been, but growing up in a world so cold that made it hard for a kid to not lose hope. Am I just a voice for a last generation? The ignorance of people taught me to be patient. So be patient and stay humble. Defeat the hatred and watch the walls crumble. Don't let the pain of the world steal your smile. Don't let the concrete tame what was once wild. I run wild. No borders and no fences. Tobacco in the wind in all four directions. 17 years of obsidian eyes. Sail across the ocean of meridian lines to where oblivion lies. I'm ahead of my time, I'm just a young fool As you see the sunrise Is it just me? Or is it this city? If your response to Native Hawaiians asking us not to go to Hawaii is we should be able to go anywhere in our 50 states as a part of our country, remember that it shouldn't be. We took Hawaii by force. Hawaii was an independent sovereign nation ruled by Queen Laleo Kalani until she was forced to give up her throne after a coup staged by Sanford B. Dole. Like, the pineapple dole. In fact, after he forced her to give up the throne in 1895, he was in charge up until the United States annexed Hawaii in 1898. However, Hawaii didn't become a state until over 60 years later in 1959 because the government didn't want Hawaiians in Congress, meaning that they didn't see Hawaiians as Americans and vice versa. And that sentiment is true today, likely even for you. Part of why y'all want to go to Hawaii so bad is not because it's beautiful, but because you have exoticized it in your mind, meaning that you don't see it as America. And now that we've done way more harm than good, the best thing we can do is help as we are told and then leave them alone. I'd rather you not like this post. Instead, hit the share button and hit copy link. Space car screaming trap me with a baby. Oh, you wish with your trick is crazy. <laughs> It's berry season, which is a great time for the reminder. It's an aggregate berry and you're in North America, it's edible. This is an Allegheny blackberry, but even before I knew the specific species, I knew I could eat it. Oh, so good. Few things in this life are better than a sun warmed berry. And before someone's like, what about Jack in the pulpit? Jack in the pulpit is not like one aggregate berry unit. These are just a bunch of berries close together, not an aggregate berry. Oh, and also golden seal, this guy who also is just like a lot of little fruits close together, not like a compound berry. You won't get it confused with the other ones. So get out there and enjoy your berry season while it's still happening. Happy snacking. Uh, uh, uh. Don't die! <laughs>